Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we, we were actually listening to the third very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, uh, it got disconnected. Uh, but we already heard two very interesting presentations on uh, Kenya and Cameroon. Uh, I also looked at the paper on Ghana. I think uh, uh, they have they've come up with almost the very common, some common stories. Uh, I think uh, where I'm coming from, uh, from South Asia, and looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, I think many things we have in common, especially when it comes to challenges of uh, mobilizing domestic savings. But at the same time, few things probably what we can offer uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of uh, getting some uh, lessons, uh, the way South Asian countries perform, and definitely the East Asian or Southeast Asian countries perform better than South Asian countries. So we can look, look at those issues. I think those will be uh, very, very important to uh, understand the whole topic, what we are discussing today. Uh, I thought that the first point is, of course, uh, looking at the economic performance issues, uh, especially the way the, the pattern of economic growth and in sub-Saharan Africa, it has been low and it has been volatile. I think that is also uh, extremely important to understand uh, how to mobilize domestic savings. Uh, if you look at some of the other South Asian countries or Southeast Asian countries, in terms of volatility, in terms of uh, keeping a healthy economic growth rate for a longer period of time, I think we, we see some uh, kind of some marked differences. Uh, and that is also very much related to building the economic resilience in terms of, uh, with respect to the shocks, external shocks. I think this is also extremely important because savings behavior can be affected as you have very, in, in a couple of the papers we saw, external shocks can actually affect the savings behavior. And how to absorb the external shocks, the resilience of the economy is extremely important. So my point is that uh, when we uh, think of the uh, kind of unsatisfactory performance of sub most of the sub-Saharan African countries in terms of mobilizing savings, uh, we need to look at their growth pattern. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that these three papers actually look at, looked at this. Now, when it comes to the growth and savings nexus, so which one affect one? I, definitely, we all agree that it has a kind of, uh, you know, feedback loop. So, savings leads to investment, investment leads to growth, and the growth leads to a rise in income. Then it leads to savings. So there is a kind of uh, circularity there. But uh, also, one of the very recent papers by uh, Professor Kunal Sen and his colleague uh, looked at the how productivity growth actually affected uh, savings. So when you look at, when you take into account all these issues, I think definitely a sustained period of economic growth which can actually build the productive capacity uh, and then can lead to building the confidence of the uh, households uh, or other economic agents. Uh, that is extremely important uh, for the sub-Saharan African countries and that is not only for sub-Saharan African countries, I think uh, that is applicable to the South Asian countries as well. Uh, but then, how do we do that? How do we achieve those uh, kind of sustained period of economic growth? And in terms uh, to achieve those that's targets, I think those we need to look at those economic policies. I'm very glad that these three papers try to look at those economic underlying economic policies, macro policies, uh, monetary policies, fiscal policies. Uh, but then. Uh, if we really want to, uh, if we, uh, if if I have, if I if I don't, I don't uh, misunderstood it, that the larger savings in sub-Saharan Africa, like many other developing countries, that is actually generated by the households. Uh, uh, so, how to actually, uh, uh, what kind of economic policies, what kind of uh, uh, economic uh, macro and, and and micro policies, especially financial policies, can lead to uh, larger household savings uh, in the South Southern Africa. That is extremely important. And uh, I, I agree that uh, when it comes to uh, public savings, the relation of public savings with the uh, private savings, uh, you may not really get a very conclusive uh, picture. But again, it's true that if government runs on very large de-savings, 
and then that these savings is, has to be financed by external borrowing and then you have a larger debt burden that also leads to uh, building less lesser confidence within the economy and which can actually also affect households savings here so all these are very much uh, interconnected and then uh, also you don't really find that which one affect directly or which one is very strongly exogenous because they are also interdependent to each other uh, related to this i thought that and also it came out in very strongly in a couple of the papers that the financial sector development is extremely important because looking at the experience of the east asian countries and also some of the south asian countries the way uh, savings facilities have been developed and especially removing the households borrowing constraints it actually helped uh, uh, the small and rural savers to increase their savings at a low transaction cost so this is something uh, is very very important but uh, even from bangladesh the experience what i can share with you that many banks and even under government's policy initiatives which uh, we have seen in a couple of the papers that government has taken initiatives to offer several financial products to the households but actual uptake of these products don't they don't it doesn't really necessarily depend on the number of products being offered by the banks or the or, or the initiatives because there are many other constraints which can actually affect uh, the uh, savers to actually under, uh, uptake those uh, um, those those uh, uh, products financial products for example there is a very uh, strong policy initiative by the government in bangladesh for the women's financial inclusion uh, how to increase the financial inclusion of the women and many banks because of the government's policies they are coming up with many financial products for women to undertake uh, uh, to un undertake this uh, uh, products but when you have an economy where actually in, in, in South Asia, it's not very uh, uh, prob uh, applicable probably in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, because in South Asia you will have, you will see that low female labor force participation uh, in the economic activities. Whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa, on average, the female labor force participation rate is higher. So, in, so what I'm saying that in South Asia, uh, uh, where you have those products being offered, but because of women's low participation in the economic activities, the uptake of those services become very, very less. So this is something probably we need to highlight that too. So the whole idea of financial deepening, financial inclusion becomes extremely important. Now, how do you devise it? And how do you, what kind of products you offer, which can effectively be taken by the savers, that will enhance the overall domestic savings scenario. Uh, one, uh, one factor I thought that which is structurally given for, uh, kind of given in the sense for the Sub-Saharan African, uh, uh, on average for the Sub-Saharan African countries, uh, which is you can't really solve this problem uh, in a short time, which is the kind of demographic structure. Because of very high uh, age dependency ratio, I just give you the comparison that a uh, very recent figure, the Sub-Saharan African countries has 82% of age dependency ratio, you know, in proportion to the working age population. Whereas in South Asia, it is only 51%. And East Asia, it is 48%. So that means that structurally, there is a kind of disadvantageous position for the Sub-Saharan African countries. If you have a very large age dependency, uh, dependent population, who doesn't really save? So then it becomes difficult to mobilize resources. What does it mean? It means that for Sub-Saharan African countries to overcome this challenge, you need some extraordinary efforts need to be undertaken. So some very conventional way of thinking would not really work. And that can also be translated into uh, in a positive side, like, uh, you know, you can look at the demographic dividend, especially uh, the demographic dividend phase, many of the Sub-Saharan African countries they're going through, and which can actually be very helpful if that demographic dividend uh, can be uh, uh, effectively utilized or, or, or uh, reaped. So I think that is something, a bigger challenge. How do you ensure a decent job? How do you ensure uh, larger or better productive employment opportunities for this young population, which would eventually turn into uh, 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 contributing to larger saving generation? Uh, finally, I thought that uh, I was really very interested to uh, look at Ghana's paper when the title was institution, but I was really not really finding that institution aspect probably, as you said, 15% work is 
uh, <laughs> remaining, <laughs> probably that, that one is extremely important, that the role of institution. And Professor Sen, he has worked quite extensively on that too, that the, in terms of the state capacity, in terms of integrity of the financial sit system, the way it can uh, build the confidence uh, among the savers, in terms of political stability, uh, especially or also in terms of having a very large informal sector, uh, in effect, it leads to large uh, dominance of informal institution. So when you have the dominance of informal institution, then again, uh, you know, how do you really mobilize savings at the national level? Uh, it becomes d difficult to generate those large uh, savings. There are problems of property rights. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, especially when you impose taxes, land taxes, when land rights are not very clearly defined. Uh, then, of course, the other institutional issues like control of corruption or legal system, all these are extremely important. And I'm quite sure that uh, so in, in the Ghana's paper, when you work on this, probably you can highlight on these things as well. I have a couple of points for the, uh, for the papers. For example, the Kenya paper, probably, Rose, you could highlight a little bit more on the model you applied, especially what kind of econometric model you did. Um, in the Cameroon case, um, ERDL is, is definitely is, 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 is a very good application, but you also found that when you put both the per capita GDP and per capita GDP growth together, then it becomes difficult to explain. So I think better you, the way you did for regression three and regression four, keep them separate. Uh, and, uh, and then for, uh, I think the Ghana paper, we unfortunately, we missed that uh, uh, the presentation one. My final comment would be uh, that, uh, these, all these three country papers are looking at more using time series data. Uh, the pro, this is a definitely an advantage because uh, when you take into account, look at the country context and try to understand what are the factors determining domestic savings or national savings. But there are problems too, because when many of the data or many of the indicators, what we are talking about, especially in the regressions, uh, some of them are actually not very well developed especially if you look at the, if you even plot those data, you may not find much variation. Uh, I think in, in addition to this time series regression, uh, in e each of these papers, I think it would be good to bring in all this comparative analysis, uh, you know, the way South Asia or Southeast Asia, how they actually address those challenges and what kind of lessons you can, uh, uh, you can, you can, you can get from those, uh, you know, by comparison. At the same time, some cross-country analysis too. I think that would actually add b more insights to your analysis. With this, I'd like to conclude here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving us the conclusions to your paper. I think we now have another eight minutes for discussions. I will now open it up to the plenary um, before we can cut up. So any questions from the plenary? Karen, you look like you're urging to go. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you for the very good uh, presentations. Um, um, one question I'd like to ask um, uh, the lady from Ghana. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the default by Ghana and um, whether you think more local savings would have um, uh, supported the country not to default on its debt? Um, the other issue is um, you, what you said about people not being able to meet their basic needs. I think when we look at savings, we need to look at it also vis-a-vis -vis the level of employment and also the um, number of people that are living below the poverty line. Uh, the other third question is um, when we look at um, uh, savings and revenue, domestic revenue mobilization, debt is a fast charge. Um, over the government uh, revenue collections. How does that uh, affect the country in terms of uh, mobilization of resources and in terms of development? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any another question? Yes or no? Oh, okay for you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, this is just a comment, uh, and it's going to Abraham. Uh, you said that uh, in Cameroon we have a central bank which manages the region, central African region. So this is where we get the monetary policy. So is it is there a possibility that's why we have high savings, but savings not growing because we have a common monetary policy. So that if you're controlling, they say the interest rates, it may be for the region rather than for the specific country. And in that case. Are there initiatives taken in Cameroon to ensure savings go up? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's covered in the paper, I'm just summarizing. Then something else which you may also need to consider in the ARDL framework is the critical values. Because if the time period is so short, then uh, uh, there are critical values which were calculated by Narayan, I don't know, it's 20 something. Because the idea is that if the period is so short, then the critical values are uh, understated. So maybe that can help you in doing the co-integration. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I had a question. I mean, we talked about macro policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, talked about external shocks, but I didn't see too much of a discussion of financial liberalization or repression. If you look at the Latin American experience when they had financial liberalization and it had a very negative effect on domestic saving. If you look at the East Asian experience, they had followed financial repression, in other words, keeping interest rates capped uh, almost to a point of negative real interest rates, and that often is argued that that's why they had high domestic savings. So one, what is the experience of Cameroon, Ghana, and, uh, and Kenya with financial liberalization? And if, yeah, and, and if they have had financial liberalization, what are the implications for domestic saving? Are they following a Latin American model or are they following an East Asian model? Because that's a really important question going yeah. forward because yeah. many countries are liberalizing their financial markets. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, could we take three questions? And we've got five minutes, so we need to be quick with the answers. Monica, the first three were yours. Yes, thank you very much um, for the question. So the first question I had had to do with um, our current debt crisis that we are in. Like um, The question was, do I think if we had more savings, um, we, maybe we wouldn't have defaulted on our debt? I, I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously, high savings is good, and then you know the, the, the state can have access to resources. I, I think uh, in our case, the default on the debt um, perhaps has to do more with how um, it's spent because um, the, the, we had a, a, a quite a high uh, proportion of people actually um, saved up a lot. And so most of these people have actually had to undergo um, the debt restructions, uh, restructuring that we are at, the country is actually facing now. So we have private people who have lost a lot um, because of that. So I don't think The response was quite good. Okay, all right. Could you go to Abraham? Do you have any reaction to the comment? Yeah. So first, in in terms of the time period, um, the data is from 1980 to 2018, right? That gives you on average, you know, 38 to 39 observations. So it's um, unless you're going to have a time period of 50 years, I think that's decent enough for some rigorous time series analysis and you can be relatively confident in, you know, the kinds of um, statistics and critical values you might have. In terms of the central bank, yeah, the, the country has tried to implement measures to increase savings, right? But the central bank actually controls um, the reserve requirements, isn't it? So in terms of the country-specific measures to increase savings, in terms of... Um, um, granting more access to credit to um, private borrowers and uh, expanding credit significantly to small and medium-sized enterprises and even the most micro of enterprises. The, the various countries have taken up those initiatives and that's actually what contributed more to their increase in savings. You cannot um, discount the importance of the central bank, but their effect, so you can actually feel the, what they are doing is more palpable in terms of the amount of reserves which you're supposed to leave with the bank and rather than the amount of savings which you're going to have. So in terms of the reserves, yes, that may have contributed significantly to the savings in each of those countries. But then um, there are also quite um, good initiatives in terms of what the government has been trying to do to increase savings. In terms of financial liberalization, the financial sector in Cameroon is relatively constrained to begin with. So even if you were completely liberalized per se, 
I don't imagine it having any serious effects on savings because, like I said, it's quite constrained. But it's something worth thinking, and um, I can add it to the 15%, like I said, and you know, try to see if there's been anything about it and what we can glean from that. Um, I, I can respond to uh, uh, Selim uh, asked uh, uh, how we went about uh, doing our study. And uh, one of the things you'll find uh, for these case studies, uh, we have used the uh, almost similar uh, methodology. One, basing it on the life, uh, life cycle hypothesis. And secondly, we also tried to uh, kind of standardize the variables uh, that we were using uh, to allow for even comparison across the, uh, the various uh, uh, studies. So for Kenya, we, uh, we used the uh, uh, period 1980 to 20, 2019, and uh, the same, same things that uh, uh, my colleague here was explaining, the ARDLs uh, uh, sort of uh, methodologies is the same thing that uh, we used, and uh, the same variables that uh, he was uh, bringing out are the same variables that we used. So um, um, in terms of uh, financial liberalization, uh, thanks, Prof. I think we, we may want to look again, uh, because uh, between 1980 and 2019, very many things have happened in the, in the country. Uh, between 1990, 1980 to 1992, that's the period before the uh, interest rates were liberalized. Uh, 1992 to, say, 2016, 17, that's the period before the interest rate capping, yeah? Um, so it's something that we actually uh, didn't bring in, uh, uh, but uh, probably it's something that we need to explore. And maybe uh, this time around, maybe use a, a kind of a, a, a dummy variable, uh, because I think the interest rate, even when we, we use it as a real interest rate it's itself, may not capture all the, those uh, uh, dynamics. But I want to say that uh, Yes, with the liberalization, we saw the interest rates actually, the, 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 the deposit rates are, are slightly going up. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the clear period when, when you, you, you saw inter, uh, domestic uh, deposit rates actually uh, staying almost to a higher level uh, in nominal terms is the period when we had the capping because uh, with the capping they were kept at a certain level but after that they have gone back to uh, uh they have they have gone down again but it's an interesting area that uh, we may want to re-estimate and see whether uh, taking a dummy variable would actually uh, give us something different here thank you was your question answered yes. oh, fantastic all right monica do you have to your final ra uh, points <laughs> I hope I hope this All time right. it, it will get question, um, my question was on um, why perhaps if we had more savings that could have reduced the defaults on our um, on our debts and my answer was that um, not quite because we still we um, there was a lot of um, high savings high rates of savings amongst um, private um, you know individuals even to the extent that even when we had the restructuring of debt with the interest rates going up, we still had the government's um, bonds, actually uh, the government's bills actually being oversubscribed. So I don't think the issue of our default on debts is coming from the lack of savings. I think it's just mainly from coming from the fiscal side, how we are actually spending it. Um, just before my internet goes out on me again, let me answer the second question that had to do with um, the um, focusing on employment and then the poverty line as the lady um, who asked the question earlier said. So Ghana, the, in Ghana, the, the informality is about 80%, right? So yes, you can imagine that people, um, the, 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 because, because of the high informality that we have, incomes may not be as high as um, you know, we, would, we would want, we would hope for. So you have a situation where people are still um, unable to cater for their basic needs, so then savings wouldn't wouldn't be the first thing they'll be thinking about when um, they get um, their money. And aside that, 
um, yes, there's been a lot of discussions about how to widen the tax um, net to be able to rope in people in the in informal sector because most we, we do have very high tax rates, I think. Um, you know, the VATs are very high. We've had COVID levy. We've had, um, you know, we have, we have so many levies that, um, you know, tries to bring in the informal sector because of the high informality that we have. So there are all these discussions going on, but I think that it's important, like the discussant said, to be able to think of very innovative ways to be able to, you know, broaden the, the tax base so that we can rope in more um, revenue um, for our development agenda. We, we, the time is fast spent and I want to respect everybody's um, time. So thank you very much for the opportunity to respond to some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, the internet kept falling all the time. Sorry about that. Okay, so I think we've, uh, we'll wrap it there. It's been a very nice, engaging discussion. I want to thank the panel and the discussant. Uh, there's a lot of learnt as well, uh, coming from uh, a, a country that uh, we feel the impact of, of these challenges you've, we've just mentioned. And I think we'll take all this now forward to formulate into some form of policies for our nations and see how we can help increase the levels of savings. So thank you very much. I want to thank the audience. And thank you, Monica, for staying on uh, despite the challenges. Okay, thank you, man. I wish you well.